today we're going to hear the story of a king who grew too enamored with his own glory, his own domain, who built something up on the backs of his people and was swiftly humbled. And I am, of course, talking about the infamous king of Salamisand, the great Yertle the Turtle. I'll give you a minute to catch up to that one. But no, I mean, we're not talking about Dr. Seuss today. It ain't that kind of church. But we're going to be in, talking about Nebuchadnezzar. And as I was reading this story, like this is just like Yertle the Turtle, where his kingdom gets so big, and then he notices something in the heavens that is higher than him, and gets angry about it, and then falls flat down on his face, and it becomes king of nothing more than the mud, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. We have seen so far, Nebuchadnezzar has grown in his understanding of who God is. In the first episode, he learned, okay, God can reveal mysteries. No other God can do that. The last one, he learned, okay, God can deliver his people more than any other God, even through my fiery furnace. But as we said last time, he's not there yet. He's given two proclamations to honor the God of Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but they always end with, and if you don't, we're going to tear your house down, impale you on a stake, and turn your house into a latrine. It's like, all right, you're, you're maybe on your way, but that's not how we do things when we serve the Lord. But we've seen this, that he's on this journey. He's refused last time to accept the fact that his kingdom might end. Remember, he saw the vision of the golden head and the silver arms and chest and then the bronze and the iron and the iron and clay, which indicated that his kingdom would someday end. So the next thing we see Nebuchadnezzar doing is building a 90-foot statue that is all of gold. His heart was proud. But as I think you've seen, he had a very open heart to the things of God. And because God saw that in him, God is going to take the time to bring him along what I believe to be the rest of the way. But what's going to have to happen to Nebuchadnezzar is that he's going to have to be humbled now, how do you take a man who stylizes himself as the king of kings, who has conquered the known world at the time, and is creating wonders of the world in his own city? How do you humble a guy like that? Well, the answer is you make him think he's a cow for seven years. <laughs> it's okay to laugh at this story. You're supposed to laugh at this story. You're supposed to see this and think, how ridiculous! The great king mooing around on the back 40. But pride is not just the domain of kings and billionaires and superstars. Pride is something that tests each and every one of us. And sometimes people that have nothing can be the most prideful people because they've never had to actually do anything. Therefore, what I could have done is just about infinite. We've all met people like that, right? Watching the, watching the ball game, I, if that was me, I would have hit 55 home runs by this, by this time, you know. And they, Oh, but you never played. Yeah, but if I did, it would have been great. God sees that. God knows what's up. And God will not be mocked by you or by me. So in the words of the first worship song I ever learned to play on guitar, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. So let's look at this. Verses 1 through 3 of chapter 4. And we have here the opening of a letter or a decree. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. These three verses in the Septuagint, which is the official Greek translation of the Bible, are included with chapter 3. They're tacked on to the end of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but uh, the older Hebrew versions and, and the way it's translated in English as well places us at the beginning of chapter 4, and that's the proper way to do it because we see we're beginning something new. He's addressing all peoples, nations, and languages. He's, he's going to tell this next story in the form of a proclamation. And it's entirely possible, and I believe likely, that what you have here is Daniel included a copy of this proclamation in his manuscript when he was putting it together. He greets his subjects, 
all peoples, nations, and languages. So not even just his subjects, but the subjects beyond his kingdom. He says, peace be multiplied to you, which is a very Semitic greeting. The Hebrews say shalom, which means peace. The Arabs say salam, which also means peace. You can hear the relationship between those two words. So, peace be multiplied to you. And he's going to declare the purpose of what follows, which is to give his testimony. It seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. And Nebuchadnezzar writes this at the end of the story, of course. So at the beginning, he frames the lesson for us. So what Jesus would do this sometimes with his parables. What we're supposed to learn from this chapter is written right here in verse 3. And it's put in poetic form. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. So that is a, we call them Hebraisms because it's related to Hebrew, but it's really, it's for any kind of Semitic poetry of the time. We in English poetry look for rhyme, we look for meter, we look for certain forms. They had something that was called Semitic parallelism, which is each pair of lines would either build on each other, contrast each other, or basically restate the same purpose over again. So how great are his signs? How mighty his wonders. It's the same thing, but with different words. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So that is why in most of your newer translations, verse 3 is in a separate format in poetic lines, because that is how it was written. And that's what we're supposed to learn. First of all, that God does great miracles. And second, that his kingdom will endure for all generations. He calls the Lord the Most High God. This is in Aramaic. This is Elaha Eli. It's very similar to how Abraham would refer to the Most High God, except that was Hebrew. It was El Elyon. Maybe you've seen the Lord referred to as Elyon before. It means highest or most high. And I wish I could take some time to get into this. Maybe we will another time. But what it seems like by calling God the Most High, if you're familiar with various cultures and their mythologies and their pantheons, they would have their gods. Then there would usually be like gods above those gods. So the Greeks had, you know, Mount Olympus and they had the Titans. And then above that, there was always like this supreme, highest, untouchable, inaccessible deity that rules over all things. So the Greeks had that. The uh, Hebrews had that, or not the Hebrews, but the um, Semitic cultures in this time had that. Uh, the Norse gods had that. And it seems like by calling him the most high God, he's saying, forget all these petty little things that we thought were something. I'm worshiping the highest, the Elaha Eli. In Acts 17, 23, what does Paul say when he shows up to, uh, to Athens? He says, I see that you are very religious. I even saw an altar to the unknown God. And that's who I want to declare to you. He says, this is the God who made the heavens and earth. And in Greek mythology, that, that God was so far above all the other gods, like you can't even know anything about him. And Paul goes, I know something about him. It's that little seed grain remaining testimony from the earliest days when people knew who the Lord was until False gods usurped his authority. So really by saying what the most high God has done, they would have been understood. And it also would have been astonishing to hear him say that you can know the most high God. Well, really, the most high God got hold of him, huh? And that is how we ought to conceive of God. As the one who is above everyone and above everything. People say really snarky things like, why do we always talk about heaven as if it's up there? Because that's how the Bible describes it. That he's higher. But it's not just talking about space, right? Like that direction. It's terms of authority and power and rank. He's higher than you. He's better than you. He's above you. And the covenant name of God, you know this in Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, when Moses asked his name, God said, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. That is such a profound title for God that we've discussed at great length many times. But I'll just remind you, God is self-existent. This characteristic of God is called aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y, aseity, meaning God 
depends on nothing for his existence. There never was a time when there was not God. So to try to think of God as floating around in space is wrong. God made space. God made time. God made everything that you see. God is not limited by anything. All things proceed from him and return unto him. I would add also Philippians 2.9 tells us that Jesus Christ is the one that has received all that glory from the Father. He also has the name that is above every other name. So it's not just the Old Testament God as if they were separate from one another. It is the holy triune I am himself. The covenant name was probably pronounced Yahweh. It's sometimes been uh, vocalized as Jehovah. As long as you understand what he's saying, that matters. That every other god, they look, oh, well, Athena came because Zeus had a headache and then they cut his head open and out came Athena and Apollo. Well, my god didn't come about that way. My god never came about. My god was, was and is and will be. You see why in Revelation, when it talks about Jesus, who was and is and ever will be, that's a reference back to the aseity of God, the covenant name of God. Therefore, what's the point here? It is wise to be humble before a God like that. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So we come to the beginning of chapter 4, and we see this very appropriate acknowledgement of God as Most High, bowing down to the Lord of the Hebrews, Coming off of this chapter where he threw some people into a fiery furnace for not bowing down and worshiping his golden statue. So what happened? <laughs> what happened in between chapter 3, verse 30, and chapter 4, verse 1 that would cause this guy, of all people, to say this? Well, he's going to tell us. Chapter 4, verse 4, and we'll read down to verse 18. I, Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar wrote some scripture. How about that? was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. It was like deja vu, huh? Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. You get the idea that he wanted Daniel right away, but maybe Daniel was on a business trip. Who knows? He who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom, meaning Daniel, is the spirit of the holy gods. We'll come back to that. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. So this is different. He can remember the dream, and he's willing to, to share it this time around, not like chapter 1. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, Tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Okay, familiar story. 
Once again, King Nebuchadnezzar is afflicted with dreams. Once again, he calls for his Chaldean advisors. And we say, why would he listen to them? Well, remember, these guys had a wide range of responsibilities, and they were not totally useless, although when it came to matters of the spirit, as we discussed, they were, which is why, again, they are helpless. And he calls for Daniel. Now, he calls him Daniel, and then he clarifies his Babylonian name was Belteshazzar. So it's interesting because we see that Nebuchadnezzar refers to Daniel by his Hebrew name, which is an incredible mark of respect and honor. But when he's making a proclamation to the rest of the nation, they would have known him as Belteshazzar, just as they would have known Hananiah as Shadrach and so on. And he has this vision of a great tree that grows with its heights up to the heavens. Its branches stretch out over the earth. Similar language, if you look at the the Aramaic here, to how they describe the firmament in Genesis being spread out over the earth. And he has this picture of this great tree with birds nesting in its branches and finding shade there. Ezekiel 31 verse 6 makes a similar comparison to Assyria. It says the Assyrian Empire was a great tree and the birds made nests in its branches. Jesus in Matthew 13, 32 says that the kingdom of heaven starts out as a mustard seed, but then it grows into a great tree and the birds dwell in its branches. So knowing the book of Daniel sheds a little bit of light on what Jesus is talking about because he says it starts small, but it's going to grow and cover up everything, just like the rock that broke the statue and became a mountain. So we have this enormous tree Then comes a watcher. I want to circle that word. The Aramaic word word there is ear. And basically this is an angel who is going to announce the destruction of the tree. We'll talk a little bit more about the watchers in just a second uh, because it is an interesting thing. But the vision is this angel comes who declares that the tree is going to be destroyed. And that's what he sees. The tree is cut down. Its branches and its fruit are scattered. The trunk is bound by iron and bronze. And then it switches from talking about the tree, and it says, let him and to he, that he will be wet with the dew of heaven, that he will eat and think like a beast. And it says in verse 16, for seven periods of time. This is the Aramaic word idan, and it means a time. Usually it refers to a year, but it is broader than that, which is why it translates it time. So in chapter 7, verse 25, it'll say that the Antichrist will rule for time, times, and half a time, which we've all basically interpreted to mean three and a half years. So seven times, same word here, probably seven years, but it is a little more flexible from that, uh, more flexible than that, so um, it doesn't have to be specific. And it says there, this is such an interesting verse in verse 17, this sentence is by the decree of the watchers. This is the only book in the Bible that refers to the watchers. It also calls them holy ones. And it says, they have declared and decreed that this will happen so that the whole world will know that the Most High, that's Jehovah God, is the King of Kings who sets up and tears down rulers. So what is this decree of the watchers? Now, many people want to do the wrong thing with this. A lot of the intertestamental period literature, so the books of Enoch and so on, talk an awful lot about the watchers. And they have all these very fanciful interpretations about them. But here's the problem. They got that from Daniel, and that is not scripture. So the idea that Daniel was, I've heard this, was pulling from a common understanding of who these things were. No, actually, he is the first one to state this. And then a whole interesting theology came from that that is never repeated anywhere else in your Bible. So a lot of people say the best way to understand Daniel is to understand the stuff that came later. I I disagree with that. If it's not scripture, I'm not so interested in what it has to say. But who are these, these watchers, these holy ones? Now, we tend to use the single word angel to encompass all of these these heavenly things that we see. And, you know, we have a very clear picture. An angel is basically a guy who has wings or maybe a fat little baby with, you know, wings fluttering around and, you know. um. But the Bible, as we, you know, we've talked about this before, angels are radical in the Bible. This is even like an online meme now. The like, you know, <laughs> what we think about angels, what the Bible says about angels, the wheels within the wheels and the eyes. And remember the one that said the angels were here, but their spirits were in the wheels. 
from Ezekiel, like, what does that mean? I don't know. That's just what it says. And whenever somebody in the Bible sees these things, they fall down on their face and freak out. That's why the first thing an angel always says is what? Fear not. Don't be afraid. Because you might be afraid. Right? Four faces and six wings, and some of them have hooves, and you know, the face of a lion and a bull and an eagle and a man. And sometimes angels are described as men. But here it's just called a watcher, a holy one. And it says that they have a, basically a group that can make decrees. Now we see this elsewhere in the Bible as well. In 1 Kings 22, the Lord says, gathered all of his heavenly hosts together. Heavenly host is a very common phrase to describe angels. And he said, we need to bring judgment on Ahab. Who has any ideas? This is one said this and one said that. And then one angel said, I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets to send him off to battle. And that's the plan they went with. That is such a cool little insight into how God does things. Job also talks about the, the sons of God, the angels coming together before him. So we see that apparently there is a council of angels that God includes when he makes decisions. And we say, is God allowed to do that? Well, he listens to you when you pray. So God delegates authority. That Daniel talks an awful lot about that, actually. We're going to see this later on, that just as God has delegated authority to man in the physical, he's delegated authority to angels in the spiritual. So it seems to me that God decided, okay, we got to do something about Nebuchadnezzar. What are we going to do? And the watchers, the ones that watch the world, it's not a complicated idea, right? The angels came together and they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make him think he's a cow for seven years. God goes, all right, I like that plan. Let's go with that. Psalm 82 talks about this, uh, this whole idea. In Psalm 82, verse 1, it says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And so, some translations say, well, not gods. It says elders. It doesn't say elders. It says gods. Elohim is the word it uses. Verses 6 and 7 of that chapter, the Lord says to them, You are gods, I said, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. That is one of like the most trash-talky psalms in the Bible. It says, God sits down with this divine counsel. He says, I said to you, you are gods, meaning I gave you authority over the nations to rule over these things and to administer my kingdom. But the middle of that psalm is all about, but you didn't do a good job. Instead, you took all the authority for yourself and had them start worshiping you instead of me, which is why the Lord says, I said you are gods, but you shall die like men. That's so cool. That God says that to these usurping, sinful, fallen angels. He goes, oh, you think you're something, right? You, you think you're better than men because you can't die? Guess what? Your time is coming too. There's this whole window that we get in the book of Daniel to what happens behind the scenes. Christian, don't ever be embarrassed by the words angel and demon. That's a, that's a biblical thing that you need to keep in mind or else you're going to be deceived. In any case, the lesson here is that God is watching. The Lord sees your pride. God is not aloof in the sky. This is a, an enlightenment idea that we still hold on to, that God is so much bigger than us. Why would he pay any attention? Well, that's what David said in Psalm 8. But David knew he still gets involved. God intervenes in the world. God participates. He observes and he cares. You say, why would God care? Well, why do you care about what your little babies are doing? You know, children do stuff that you, you would never spend any time doing. You're not going to sit there and play with the box while you got something cool over there. But you do it because you love your kids. If you've ever created something artistically, a painting or a book or a poem or a song, you, know, you get invested in it. You care about it. Kings care about their kingdoms. So your pride is a matter of concern to heaven. Paul told us in Romans 12, 3, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. I love that sober judgment. We've talked about it before. Drunk judgment is bad judgment, isn't it? High judgment is bad judgment. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I would never have done that. I just I had one too many. Yeah, that's called drunk judgment. He says, you look at yourself with sober judgment. 
Now, somebody who is, who is drunk, he thinks he can beat up the whole bar. Yeah. You all bring it on. I, I'll take all of you. That's why you've got to have friends to pull him back. So Paul is using this analogy and saying, sober judgment. Don't think too much of yourself. That's the analogy Paul used. If you, that bothers you, I'm sorry. That's what Romans 12 says. If you are thinking of yourself spiritually like a drunkard thinks about himself physically, you will overinflate your own importance. Groups do this a lot. We'll, we'll look at it this way. Groups will do this. Because a lot of times we think of a proud person as kind of this lone ranger, I'm better than all of you. And yeah, those people exist. But a lot of times we'll have pride amongst ourselves. People in my country are better than everywhere else. Not just, I love my country and I don't want to live everywhere else. We're just a step above the rest of them. They don't know what they need. It's up to us to determine what they need. Our ethnic groups... You get together, and you, whether, you know, sometimes you say it loud, sometimes you say it quiet, but people are like, just, I just can't stand X, whatever the group is. I just can't stand these people, and like, you know, we're, we're supposed to you know, all get along, but like, we're better than them. I'm tired of acting like we're not better than them. I'm tired of letting them be above us, or I'm tired of like, bring them along. That's messed up. It's pride. Or your profession. Whatever your job is, is the most important job, and people that don't do this, they're just, they're just beneath everybody else. I'm ashamed to say it. And I don't do this, but pastors will do that. Pastors will get together and talk, really, if you want to know God, you've got to be a pastor. And if you're not, I mean, yeah, you can come along, but really, this is, this is what it's If they really loved God, then they would, all, they would all join the ministry, like I did, which is, that's messed up. We shouldn't do that, right? That's, that's not good. Or whatever your thing is, whether you're an accountant or a lawyer or a politician, it's like, well, it's th this is really where... This is where the smart people go. This is where the good people go. Whether your interest, your interest group, let me pick on nerds for a minute. They've had their day. They're going to get picked on again, okay? Now you, you, when you come together and you say things like, you're sitting there making fun of everybody that watches sports and everybody that is into what's going on in the culture at the time, and you sit at the table or you're sitting playing games or whatever, and you're just ripping these people up and down, that's pride, that is pride, and I don't know about if you all know this, but I'll go ahead and just let everybody know. Nerds are some of the most judgmental people you will ever meet in your life. Amen. They, they want to talk about how picked on they are, but when they get alone, all they want to do is rip up and down everybody that isn't into the thing they're into. And it's also hilarious, by the way, if you've ever played an online game before, all that aggression and testosterone that these guys act like they're too good for, it doesn't come out on the football field, it comes out in Halo or whatever their game of choice is dating myself by using that game, but it's all right. Your personality type. Shy people do this. Shy people think, well, I'm shy. I'm an introvert. I can't be prideful. Oh, is that what you think? <laughs> Look at that guy swaggering around thinking he's going to... Look at her. She's, she's just doing that for attention so that everybody will look at her. Doesn't she know that she's just a disgrace to all women? She should be more like me. Or he, what is this guy doing? He's just a disgrace to all of us. And, you know, that's just ridiculous. And why does everybody listen to him? And, you know, how, how many TV shows have been written where the popular kid finally gets, you know, a pie in the face at the end of the story? That's some bitter, you know, person that was shy and quiet in high school getting their TV revenge. It's pride. If it was more like me, then everything would be better. And we, let's talk about intelligence. People will say, you'll hear people say this on the news, like, not everybody is intelligent enough to make these decisions. Maybe you've known somebody like that. Like, so what do you do for a living? Well, it's, it's kind of over your head. You know, it's just, let's just say, you know, I, I make things work well for my boss. That's just a little too much. It's like, oh, man, you sound like you're a lot of fun at parties. <laughs> or your tax bracket. Your tax bracket. Oh, well, these poor people are poor for a reason. And if they could just get their act together, they could be like me, which is why only people like me should be allowed to make all the decisions. And I have found, by the way, if there is somebody that didn't earn all of that, they're usually more prideful about the tax bracket. Whether it is the husband or the wife that worked to get them there, that person is usually very humble and has an idea of what's up. But the person that kind of comes along or marries into it or inherits it, they seem to kind of like, Act, swagger around with it like they did something. But whatever it is, we shape our definition of what's most important according to our own lives. I care about cars. Therefore, people who don't are losers. We've all met that guy before. We all have one. Every neighborhood has one of those, right? That's arrogance defined, man. If the thing you're good at is the most important thing, 
then that's pride. It's arrogance. There are some people that cannot stand the thought that not everybody cares about the thing they care so much about. And they insist that everybody knows and cares about it. And I'm not talking about taking pride in doing a good job or anything like that. I'm talking about being conceited here. More than anything, what this is, it's disregarding God or blaming God and maximizing yourself. To ignore God as well, yes, well, of course, I'm one of the smartest people you've ever met. That's why I make so much money. I've just always been smarter than everybody else. Even in that school was just a joke. I just kind of breeze through, I breeze through life, and I don't get what everybody's complaining about. Not giving God any of that credit. Or maybe you minimize God and blame God. And you say, I'm so great and wonderful. If God hadn't stopped me, I could have been a billionaire by now. God is watching. God sees that. Whatever your thing is that makes you proud, God sees it. Verse 19, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. I have been in counseling situations, talking to folks after church, and they tell me something, and my thoughts alarm me. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Basically, I know I have a history of chopping off heads of wise men, but just tell me what it means. He answered and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. As in, I hope this isn't about you. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heavens and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So Daniel hears the dream. Now remember, he is full of the Holy Spirit. And as the way Nebuchadnezzar put it, the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Now, this is an interesting translation point because Elohim is the word for gods, but this is the Aramaic version. But, so one of the interesting things about translating the Hebrew is the Bible uses a plural noun with singular verbs to describe God. So when he says the spirit of the holy gods, it could be translated the holy God, singular. That would be like a capital E, Elohim. But this is, this is Nebuchadnezzar. At this stage of the game, Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan, right? He's a polytheist. So that's why it's translated that way. But here's another thing to ping the pong back here. Holy is a, not a word that other cultures used to describe their gods. That is a very Hebrew word. Holy, holy, holy. That separation, that distinctness, that moral purity. They didn't think their gods were moral. That, that's a very Christian idea, right? Read other polytheistic cultures. Their gods steal and lie and rape and murder and scheme. And basically your job is to get out of their way. But the Lord coming in and saying, I am holy, is very significant. So by referring to the spirit of the holy Elohim, it is entirely possible that Nebuchadnezzar had come to an understanding of the true God at this point. Or at the very least, it's a inspired Easter egg for those of us that understand the Trinity. And there it is. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, he's heartbroken for Nebuchadnezzar. 
You see that? He doesn't rub his hands and cackle. And say, the old goat's finally going to get what he's got coming to him. Oh, you're going to love this one, Nebuchadnezzar. God's going to chop you down. He doesn't. He's alarmed. He's heartbroken. He's, oh, my Lord, I hope it's not for you. I hope it's for your enemies. Now, this is unacceptable to a modern sensibility. He's hoping that God will not pour out judgment on his oppressor on the one that subjugated and enslaved him and tried to strip him of his culture. And he says, may it not be for you, O my king. Can I just remind us of this? Christians are not to be petty people. We are to respect God's providence, that if God places someone in authority over you, it's because he wanted them there. And that we are to show love to those that even are our enemies. You know, we love Jeremiah 29, 11, where he says, I have a plan and a purpose, a hope and a future for you. A few verses before that, in verse 7, he commanded his people, seek the welfare of the city to which you have been exiled. Because I'm exiling you to Babylon, and I want you to be the best Babylonian subjects you can. I want you to seek Babylonian, Babylon to prosper and expand and the glory of the empire to grow. That's what I want you to do. And that is not something that we like today. And in fact, because there's all this, this push, and it's a very ideological thing to kind of really exacerbate the differences between oppressed and oppressor, there are stories like this throughout history where even those that were slaves have a love for their master, and there's a benevolent relationship there. But of course, if you have a political agenda, you can't allow that to even be talked about. But that's what a Christian is to do, is to love and serve his king, his master, his empire with all of his heart. The early Christians were loyal Roman citizens. And we can't, oh, that was an evil empire. Yeah, but it was the one that God had put over them. And they ended up winning that empire. Not through the sword, but through love. So just a reminder, everybody is so angry about all these political figures and political stuff going on. And some of it you should be angry about. But at the same time, don't be, get, fall into that that everybody else does. This country stinks anyway. And I just want to see it torn down. It's the best thing, but it was just gone. That is not what God has told you to do. He told you to seek the welfare of the city to which you have been exiled, which in our case is the United States of America. So just a little reminder. But Nebuchadnezzar is the tree that will be cut down. He says, you will be driven out from among men and live like a beast for seven times. There it is again. The ultimate humiliation for the warrior king that had vanquished Assyria and Egypt. But he does have hope there. He says, you will return to your kingdom when you understand that the Most High rules. I've told you, Nebuchadnezzar, over and over again, I put you there. I can take it away. And if you refuse to acknowledge me, I'm going to humble you. In fact, I'm going to humiliate you. Those two words are very close to each other. Humble and humiliate. Humiliate tends to come from outside. Humble comes from inside is how I would understand that. But he warns him, break off your sins. Don't you like that terminology? Break them off. Break off your sins. And specifically, he tells him, show mercy to the oppressed. God is not giving him a pass on being a tyrannical dictator here. He says, you have subjugated so many peoples. And he had built this incredible empire. They, and we're going to talk about this more in a minute. But Babylon was, was the jewel of civilization at this point. But he had built it on the backs of his people. Not unlike Yertle the turtle, by the way. He stacked himself high on the backs of other people. And the Lord in the Bible does not specifically condemn that. He says, look, if you're going to build your, the nation and build the empire, that's, that's fine. Support your king in that. Pay your taxes, work hard, go to war when you're conscripted. But God also talks to his kings and says, it's not all about you, big shot. It's interesting, speaking of the USA, if you go back and you read de Tocqueville, he wondered in the early stages of the American democracy if we would ever build anything great and wondrous. Because he said, this has only ever been done by forcing the people to do it. And America doesn't do that. So are they ever going to have great art and great cities and great monuments? And I th think we've done all right for ourselves personally. But that, that's kind of how it was done for a very long time and still is. When God announces judgment, he always gives space for repentance. And that's why Daniel pleads with Nebuchadnezzar. Why he's going to be given a year here, as we'll see in the following verses. If you're walking in pride, God has probably warned you about it. 
you've probably heard a warning. And if, if you're here today, you've definitely heard a warning about it. Warnings can come through people. You get people around you that will say, look, you, you're really kind of full of yourself. you gotta, you got a pride thing going on. Now, there are some people that will be bitter and want to make you feel bad for being successful. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk about somebody you love, who cares about you, who knows you, maybe who is even above you in the, the ladder, shall we say, who says, you've got, a, you've got an arrogance thing. You can't talk like that. You can't talk like you're special or different than everybody else. You're not. Circumstances will warn you. You'll get yourself into trouble. Maybe you'll have a very near miss. You'll take some really risky financial venture because you're smarter than everybody else. And it totally blows up and you just barely hang on. You know, you got 10 cents left in the account, but hey, we're, we're still doing okay. We're still in the black. It's like, oh, we made it. But that circumstance ought to give you a little warning. Hey, you ain't all that. You are not all that. You've got to stop doing stuff like this. Sometimes your conscience will just get you. You'll say something to somebody, and you'll be strutting around, swaggering, post something online, and then your conscience will just hit you. Your guardian angel will slap you upside your head, and you go, ah, what was that? Maybe I shouldn't have posted that. Maybe I shouldn't have said things like that. Or sometimes you'll be reading your Bible, and it seems like, all oh, these verses are about pride. Hey, guess what? They're not. So if it seems like they're all about pride, God's talking to you. He's trying to tell you something. Jesus told Pilate in John 19, 10 through 11, Pilate said to Jesus, will you not speak to me? Do you not know I have authority to release you and to crucify you? I'm talking to Jesus about authority. Come on. Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I'm not sure what happened that we started getting that, that verse backwards. That pride cometh before the fall. It actually says before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I mean, it's not wrong, but it's just not, not properly quoted. Isn't that a little more intense, though? Pride goes before a fall. Now you can get up after a fall. Destruction! You ain't bouncing back from destruction, man. Pride comes before destruction. Why? Because when you're prideful, your thinking gets warped. You ever worked with somebody that truly, I'm not talking about like they had confidence, but they truly thought that they would never fail, never get caught, never lose. And you see them make more and more risky and stupid decisions. But what are, we, what are you doing? Your thinking gets warped. You start to believe your own hype. You start to strut around like you're somebody. If enough people tell you how great you are, you'll start walking around expecting people to tell you how great you are. And if they don't, you'll get upset. Fine, what do I need you for? i got plenty of people that will tell me how great I am. You start to annoy people. Pride, isn't pride annoying? Isn't that being in the room with somebody? I shouldn't tell that story. I won't tell that story. I'll, just, I'll generalize how's this. You ever been around somebody that is giving advice about what anybody can do, and it's like they're secretly bragging about how great they are? Anybody could be as wonderful as I am. Anybody could be as fit as I am. Anybody could be as beautiful as me. Anybody could be as successful. It's not that hard. And you're like, you, are re you really think an awful lot of yourself, don't you? Vanity. It's annoying. You don't want to be around people like that. You'll drive people away because all you can think about is you. And all the time, here's the dangerous thing that happens. When people start to push you away because they're sick of your pride and call you out on the carpet, you'll start to think, well, they're just too stupid to realize how brilliant I am. They're too jealous to hang around a high-status person like me. They're not willing to put the time in to be this great at something. And you're all alone because you think, that's kind of how I am, all by myself. Nobody can touch me. No, it's not that nobody can. Nobody wants to. <laughs> and the worst version of this is people who will refuse to learn anything of sound doctrine, even the gospel, except on their own authority. This is a problem. I see this a lot, and I'm seeing it more. Maybe it's because I'm a, I'm a senior pastor now, and I'm, we're starting to see more folks come through, and I'm encountering more people in this role and in this office. But there are a lot of people that do not respect any authority but their own. They don't respect mine, 
Because I'm a pastor. Well, you're just a pastor. There's tons of pastors. And they're not all smart like me, or they're not all experienced like me, or they're not all high status like I am. So uh, you're probably preaching from a bias, so let me go take a look. They don't respect sound doctrine through history. They'll say, well, yeah, but that's a long time ago. They're not as smart as we are now. There's always these scholars in uh, seminaries that are writing books about how they didn't understand the Greek of the New Testament in like 150 A.D., it's like, that was like a hundred years after. You think you get it better by reading this small handful of dusty little manuscripts you have? Or they'll say things like, listen, I know what you say that God has said, but I need to experience it for myself. I'm not going to believe anything unless I can hear it for myself. Man, how prideful is that? How, how adolescent is that? That idea, when you're, you're 12, 13 years old, 14, I don't know, whatever, and you kind of get that point, mom and dad don't know anything, I'm the smart one. Then you get a little older, and you're like, huh, turns out they had a few ideas after all. I might not have phrased it like that, but they were smart. But we get like that with God, that somehow we're able to evaluate his gospel and the way that he did it, which is why in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, God put to shame that which was wise by saving us in a manner that would be called foolish. Pride. You know what Ecclesiastes 5, 2, you know what the wisest man who ever lived said about challenging and arguing with God? He said, God is in heaven. You are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Don't talk so much when you come into God's house and come into God's presence. Proverbs 3.34 says, towards the scorners. What does it mean to scorn something? It means this. <laughs> That's scorn. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. That, okay, That's scorn. I'm not hearing a word you say because I think I'm above it. God says, towards the scorners, he is scornful. That's your attitude? That's my attitude towards you. But to the humble, he gives grace. If you feel offended by me talking about pride, this message is probably for you. Even those of us that have struggled with it in the past, at least we can know, yeah, okay, I've got to work on that. But if you sit there and you go, How d you can't say things like that to someone like me. There you go. You're being warned. God who watches is warning you. Verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Notice the shift to the third person here. It's not talking with I words. It's talking with he words now. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof, a year later, okay, on the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? And you're referring to your own majesty, man. That's another level of pride. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. Higher from him, notice. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So, one year later, Nebuchadnezzar had that astonishing ability that far too many of us have to have a radical, frightening experience with God and then promptly forget all about it. He's on the roof enjoying his great city. And in fact, we have a lot of contemporary writings from Nebuchadnezzar and from those that knew him talking about his incredible personal love for Babylon. He loved what he had built. And that's not all, that's not all bad, right? You know, have you ever met somebody from New York? It just kind of gets obnoxious after a while, isn't it? Just the greatest city in the world. Like, okay, that's fine. You can say that if you want. He had a love for his city. Most of all, by walking on the roofs of his palace. On the roofs of his palace, he had built something called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He had married a Median woman 
who means she was a Mede. She came from that country. She was brought into Babylon, and she was, she was lonely for the mountains, the, the beautiful green mountains that she had come from. So what did he do? He straight up built a mountain on top of his palace. He built one of those ziggurat formation things and covered it with every kind of tree and plant, and it was incredible. And even people like Herodotus, the her- historian, came in and were like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. So what does this tell us? It doesn't matter if you can back it up. God hates pride. A voice from heaven. The kingdom has departed from you. He goes insane. He starts to eat grass under the open sky. His hair grows out, gets all nasty. His nails get all long. I wonder, it says immediately, so it seemed like it it struck him in the moment. But they had to eventually probably hide him in one of those gardens he loved so much. This is actually a uh, documented condition, a psychological condition called boanthropy, where somebody believes that they are a cow. It's rare, as you can imagine. But even if this is that condition, it was supernaturally judged at this point. (laughs) I was laughing with Catelyn. We're having a good time today. It's not too serious, so I can do this. Do y'all remember, do y'all remember that Sesame Street song where there's the cow who sings, I'm proud, proud, proud to be a cow? I could not stop thinking of that song the whole time I was studying for this. He was proud, 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 all right, and God goes, well, now you think you're a cow. Go look it up. You'll love it, I promise. Historically, there is a three to four year gap in the account of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Many Bible scholars believe that that is where this would fit. There's also an interesting thing that doesn't refer to Nebuchadnezzar, but to his son Nabonidus, where this was found at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a story written by Nabonidus who said, for seven years I was afflicted with an illness, had to go away from my kingdom because a Jewish prophet had warned me that I was not acknowledging the Most High God. So some people have said perhaps they got the names mixed up and this was Nebuchadnezzar, not Nabonidus, or God dealt this way with all of Babylon's kings. Let's use the words of Mary, Jesus' mother, to describe what's going on in this story. Luke 1, 51 through 53. The Lord has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. That's what the gospel was. It was an inversion of what people celebrated. The mighty were brought down and the humble were lifted up. She's referring to herself there, but she's also referring to the son that would be born, Jesus, in a manger and would grow up to be the the king of kings, right? And that this subjugated nation, Israel, would be exalted above all other nations. So much for our strength, huh? So much for our wits. So much for our beauty. All of that is from God. I didn't get that from God. I worked hard to get that. But it still came from the Lord. You wouldn't have even had the capacity to do that. You wouldn't have had the ability to keep going if God had not given that to you. And he can take it from you in an instant. doesn't matter if you built it up or not. He can take it from you. The Lord often makes examples of the proud in order to teach them and to teach us who is the king. I am not saying that what I'm about to describe was the judgment of God, but isn't it ironic that the boastful, powerful Muhammad Ali ended up suffering from Parkinson's disease? I mean, it's tragic. I had a good friend that had Parkinson's. It's a a horrible thing to experience. But you step back and you look at that and you say, God can take away anything. Nothing is from you. It's all from the Lord. It's all by his providence and his will. God makes examples of proud people. Look at Acts 12, 21 through 24. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And you know the Greco-Roman culture. They loved their rhetoric, right? They loved these speeches. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, what should Herod have done at that point? Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Don't even do that. I'm not a God. I'm just a man. Give glory to the true and living God. But because he didn't, it says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten with worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased 
and multiplied. Do you see that, that comparison? His words that they all love so much that they said, these are the words of a God. He goes, you know what gods don't do? Gods don't get eaten up by worms even before they die. But God's actual word increased and multiplied because it cannot be stopped. This is why Psalm 37 tells us not to fret over evildoers. It says, stop worrying about the fact that evil people are having their way in your country. You got to take a stand, take a stand. But Psalm 37 says, they're not going to last long. God won't let it happen. You'll look for them one day and you'll say, where'd they go? We were all so scared of that guy. They were going to take over the world. Where'd they go? Because God will not be mocked. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Ask yourself this. What would it look like for you if God were to break the thing you're proud about? Maybe it would be bankruptcy. If all your investments and all your scheming were to just collapse in an instant. And everybody would see, man, we thought that guy knew something. We thought he was smart. Turns out not. Maybe it would be insanity. Maybe you are so proud of how smart you are, how intelligent you are. And by the way, you don't have to have any kind of high status to be proud of your intelligence. I've worked with people at some low level, I mean like minimum wage jobs. I've worked with a guy at Subway who was convinced that he was too smart for Oxford. He told me, he said, I, I said, where are you, you going to go to school? He goes, nah, man, I'm not going to college. I looked at Oxford and, and Cambridge, but it's like, what are they going to teach me? I'm saying, like, you're working at Subway, dude. <laughs> now, I was working there, too, so no shame. But I wasn't walking around acting like I was too good for all this. What about insanity? Maybe social collapse. Maybe your status is the thing that you are just so proud of. You, you can't stand the thought of going to that side of town or hanging out with that kind of person. And even if you see them come here in church, it's like, well, I can't tell them not to be at church, but we can sit a little at this side so that we can't, you know, they're, they're dirty and they're poor and I don't want to get it on me. What if this, it all just collapsed? What if you had nothing? We know what happens. That's what happened during the Great Depression. There are millionaires, former millionaires, and people with all this money committing suicide at a remarkable rate. I've been broke many times. I, I've had that happen at a much smaller scale, right? But if you've put all of, your, all of your, your worth and all of your identity and your pride into your money, and then it's gone, as far as you're concerned, your identity is gone. Or maybe some kind of injury. You know, I, I, it's, I'll, I'll put this out there, because I don't know if I've ever heard this talked about, but I feel God putting this on my heart. Uh, guys will do this too, but let's, let's talk about the ladies for a minute. There are some ladies that their beauty is the most important thing about them. They're going to, they're going to make sure they are seen. They're never going to let themselves be seen unless they are at the top of their game. They're posting things online that they ought not to. They take delight in being an object of lust for other people. The Lord despises that kind of vanity and pride. His pride is not some guy thing. It's not just some swaggering basketball player thing. It has all kinds of different forms. What about an, what about an injury that makes it so that now all of a sudden you don't, you don't look like you used to anymore? In fact, there's a calamity that happens to all of us where we lose our beauty. It's just called growing up, isn't it? We get older. And you've all met those people that are terrified to grow up and get older. Because if you've defined yourself by the way you look, and now the way you look starts to change, who am I? But here's the thing. God is willing to break anybody in order that he might save them. And I think that's why he's breaking Nebuchadnezzar here. Why does God bother with this guy? Because I think God knows that he's at least, there's at least a little glimmer of light in his heart. And God goes, God, I've got to break his pride, and I've got to break it fast. What do we do? Turn him into a cow. All right, let's turn him into a cow. <laughs> And sometimes if God knows that somebody, maybe they'll never repent. But what does he do? He breaks them anyway so that those that were admiring them look at them and say, there must be something else. You've got to repent even now, brother or sister, of your pride. You're never too poor or too young or too old or too anything to be prideful. Sometimes you're just proud of what your potential could have been if I had tried. That's why some people won't try anything, because then they'd have to put their money where their mouth is. It's pride. You've got to repent of that. Verse 34, though, it's got a happy ending. 
At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. There's a very upward images in this section, isn't there? The Most High. And my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. Man, when you're, when you're actually thinking straight, you worship God. And I praise and honored him who lives forever. More poetry here. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. Remember that. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven. So just in case you were getting some inflated ideas about angels, earth and heaven are both in subjection to our Lord. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. In his heart, he lifted his eyes and worshipped God. It's interesting. So I told you it's called boanthropy, when a person thinks that they're a, a cattle or something like that. But there's actually a broader thing called lycanthropy, not werewolf. It's where the word comes from. But lycanthropy, where somebody believes they're any kind of animal. And in most of the psychological literature, they say these people have a conscious awareness of what's going on, but they're just deluded into thinking that they're, they're creatures, they're animals. Sometimes they're even able to interview these people. So his mind was working at some level, and it wasn't until, as an act of his will, he lifted his eyes. Maybe he thought for seven years, kind of at the back of his, of his bovine brain, he thinks to himself, I can beat this. I can beat this. I'll get it back. And then maybe he moved on to a despair. I'll never get back. And then he gets angry. I'm never going to call upon a God that would do this to me, until finally he lifts up his eyes and says, oh, Lord. He praises God who never dies, is beyond our weaknesses. His kingdom endures. He's even beyond our strength. And he does his own will, beyond our capability. This is a good testimony. You know why? Testimonies should be 90% about God and 10% about you. Amen. You ever sat through one of those testimonies that's kind of a humble brag of all the stuff I got away with before I got saved? That's real messed up. Don't ever do that. When you're kind of like telling all these lurid details of the story so that you kind of look good, but no, I, I, I finally came around. That's not a good testimony. Nebuchadnezzar received his kingdom back, and it increased. And he wrote this letter to testify. So here's the question. Was Nebuchadnezzar saved? It sure seems like it. Sure seems like he had faith. As I extol and praise and honor the king of heaven. I acknowledge all his works are good and his ways are righteous. I don't know what else you're supposed to do at this point. James 4, verse 10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Personally, you've got to live your life in humble acknowledgement of all these things, that we are accounted as nothing. You ain't that special. You know, this is one of the things that we talk about when we're uh, going into the prison. It's like what some of these re repeat offenders, this criminal mindset, is that I am different than everybody else. I, I can get away with and do things that nobody else can. The rules don't apply for me. Those are for normal people. I'm better than all these other people. But you don't just find that in prison, friends. You find it everywhere. You've got to refuse to be impressed with your own puny efforts. We are to be servants of each other. Servants. What did Gail Irwin say? Everybody loves talking about being a servant until somebody starts treating them like one. In love and in sincerity. Not that thing that says, well, I, I want to be a good Christian, so that means I've got to be a servant of all, so I will go down to these peasants and be kind to them and do some, oh, stop that. We can smell that a mile away. Amen. Don't you know that's true? When somebody's condescending to you and they're trying to act like they're doing you a favor by doing something nice for you, it's like, you know what, just keep your favor. I'd rather you just, just leave me alone. It's got to be in sincerity. An actual understanding that you actually deserve to serve these people. Philippians 2, verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Look around at everybody else in this room and say, You're better than me. 
You're more significant than me. You matter more than me. Because when God gets the glory, man, then he'd be more than happy to exalt you. Because he'll get the glory. Matthew 23, verse 12. Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And the best example of this is our King Jesus, who emptied himself in order to live among us. And the last thing Jesus did before being faithful unto the cross was to wash his disciples' feet. The King of kings and Lord of lords, the second person of the Godhead, the holy Jehovah God, got on his knees and washed his disciples' feet. There is nothing that is beneath you. Because there was nothing that was beneath Jesus Christ. The path to salvation is to die to yourself and bow the knee to the king of heaven, like Nebuchadnezzar did. If you're too smart to be saved, you're too rich to be saved, you're too powerful to be saved, you're too pretty to be saved, then you are destined to be humbled hard, whether in this life or the next. You've got to die You've got to leave all that behind so that only Christ remains. And then that life that you live will be one of glory and testimony to our great, great God. So those of you who are prideful, this is your warning. Stop looking around at all of your stuff and thinking that you did that. That's what happened to Yertle the turtle. Stacks himself up so high, angry that the moon was higher than him. Remember the story? Maybe you don't. The moon is higher than him. That's what pride does. It doesn't matter how high I get, there has to be another level to go to. Until it all came crashing down, and as Dr. Seuss said, now the only thing he's king of is king of the mud. And that's kind of what happened in Nebuchadnezzar, isn't it? But the good news is that if you lift your eyes to heaven, shut your mouth, except in praise, and put yourself in your proper place before God, then you will be accepted and you might even be exalted in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.